Hi, my name's Steve Beatty. This is the Service Design Show. Welcome to episode 208. What if the key to outperforming your competitors lies in designing services that are not only profitable, but also genuinely beneficial for the environment and our communities? In this episode, we are exploring how. Hi, if you're new here, welcome to the Service Design Show, where we invite the brightest minds in our field and explore what's truly needed to design great services that have a positive impact on people, push our businesses forward and honor our planet. Our guest today is Steve Betty, a mathematician who ventured into medicine, archeology span and politics to eventually end up as the current CEO of the Australian Design Council, where he's dedicated to promoting and building design capacity across Australia. A pivotal moment in Steve's career came in 2008, when a seemingly small decision to attend one conference over another led him to meet his future wife and co-found the now much respected Melt Studios. Steve is a strong believer in the power of design to create positive change. We've all heard the saying, leave the world a better place than we inherited it. But as Steve will explain, it's not just about lofty goals. It's about the everyday decisions we make as designers, business owners, and even consumers. So in today's conversation, Steve will challenge the notion that positive change will require waiting for policymakers. We will explore the tension between individual action and the need for systemic change and how design can navigate this complex landscape. Talk about the fact that profit and purpose aren't mutually exclusive. We'll learn about practical tips and strategies you can implement today that prioritize longevity, if anything. This conversation will give you renewed energy to be an agent of positive change regardless of external forces. One thing that really struck me in our conversation was Steve's optimism about the future. Despite the challenges we face, he believes that we can create a better world for our children. This is an episode you won't want to miss. So join me for a great conversation with Steve Betty, and I'll catch you at the end for my closing reflections. I'm your host, Mark Fontaine, and you are listening to The Service Design Show. Welcome to the show, Steve. Thanks for having me, Mark. I'm looking forward to our conversation uh, today. We're going to talk about um, a lighthearted topic, uh, which is going to be about how we can uh, let our kids grow up, uh, improving our society in a meaningful way way so you picked something that ah you know easy to digest how how long can this take uh <laughs> shallow shallow and superficial Mark. shallow yeah. and that's how we roll here on the show um no steve uh this is going to be an interesting one to unpack um i gave a short intro uh before we uh started our uh, conversation here but for the people who haven't looked you up on linkedin yet i think it might be very interesting to uh share a few uh, defining moments of your journey and your career that got you to the point where you are today. Could you share uh, that with us? Yeah, okay. Um, I have I, I have a pretty eclectic background. Um, I always sort of preface my story with that. I, I have um, sort of academically, I've studied medicine, uh, applied mathematics and applied statistics. I studied archaeology for a little bit, did some field work in the Central Australian desert. Um, I studied business and electronic commerce, um, which I, I find myself with a couple of master's degrees as a result. Um, and I, I sort of wound my way into the field of design through the 21st century. So um, as the as the 20th century uh, wound to a close, I was working in web development, web design, um, moving into uh, sort of human-centered design and user experience. 
um, and then gradually moving over the next sort of 20, 25 years into areas of um, business strategy and service design and strategic design, um, working with organizations on solving complex problems and and and, and the rest of it. So um, it's been uh, a bit of a journey, um, but here I am. Next to that, um, you founded an agency, you wrote a book, yes. uh, you're part yes. of the Design Council. So um, I'll, I'll start with the book. Martin Tomic and I um, published a book called Designing Tomorrow, which was released, it actually had its Australian launch last week, um, but it was initially released in Europe in November through BIS, um, a publisher in Amsterdam, Mark. Um, but that was sort of two years in the in the making. Um, Martin and I sat down in late 2021 and started working on that project, which has been um, a really interesting one, I have to say. Um, the design studio, Melt Studios, we found that in late 2009, coming up on 15 years that we've been operating, um, and that's that's been a wonderful journey. We get to do a lot of really interesting work with some wonderful people. And then, as you say, I recently joined the Australian Design Council as the CEO um, alongside the work that I do at Melt. Um, and that has its own, its own role and its own sort of challenges. Amazing uh, that you still have time to get on a conversation here on the Service Design Show doing all this <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Indeed. Um, Steve, so... Um, you wanted to talk about um, improving or leaving our planet in a better way than we than we got it to our kids. Yes, finally. Yes. What drives you to explore this topic? So throughout the course of my life, Mark. So I was born in 1971. Um, so I'm 53, right? And throughout the course of my life on almost every metric that you would care to measure with the possible exception of global GDP, our world is worse off now than it was when I was born. Um, population pressures are worse, pollution pressures are worse. Um, we are like heating our planet, we are um, sending animals extinct, we are clearing our rainforests, like you you name it and we're doing, we're doing Bad to the planet, um, and it's the it is the thing that sustains us, and it really doesn't make any sense. And when I was born, we were doing all of those things, but there were less of us, and it didn't have as much of an impact. But there are a lot more of us now, and we're putting a lot more stuff into the oceans and our rivers, and we're heating our atmosphere. Um, and I, I have a very simple goal, which is that by the time my children are my age, they're looking back on a world that is improving, where they can look at each of those same metrics and go, well, the air's cleaner and the temperature's decreasing and we don't have as many tornadoes now as we used to and we don't have as many droughts or floods or hailstorms or hurricanes or cyclones or whatever it might be. Um, we're not setting temperature records anymore. You know, I wouldn't, whereas... The last 378 days have been record high temperatures for that date of the year. Um, I would I would love for them to be watching the news and for that not to be something that gets talked about. Um, and and it's absolutely possible, but that's as I say, it's a really simple goal. But I would just like for them to be waking up and seeing a world that is clearly improving rather than clearly deteriorating. You say that is a that it's a simple goal. Um, it's simple to say. Simple right? to say. It sounds um, <laughs> it sounds quite audacious, quite big. Um, of like let many questions to unpack. Maybe let's start with yeah. um, is there a, do you see a specific role for design um, in this yeah challenge? So. Uh, you, you can come at that question from a number of different directions, but let's start with the most simple one. Um, most of the stuff that we produce um, is designed. So designers play a role in the stuff that we produce, whether that's the services that we deliver or the objects that are in front of us. 
the the European Union's Commission on Circularity um, estimates that eighty percent of the waste that is produced by a product or service is locked in by decisions made during the design phase. Eighty percent. The other twenty percent is way way down downstream, right? Um, and unfortunately, that means, in my mind, quite simply, again. Very, very simply, the designers have a responsibility to make different choices during the design phase. And we have the opportunity to make different choices during the design phase to reduce that waste. That's just on the waste front. Um, something like 40% of the food that gets grown each year around the world is wasted, never gets eaten. About a trillion dollars worth of waste. Um, I read two different uh, estimates of that earlier today. One, uh, a, a low estimate of a trillion dollars US wasted annually with food that's never eaten. The upper estimate was $2.6 trillion. That's just food. If you look at textiles, it's about $500 billion annually in fabric that goes into landfill. $500 billion, 93 million tons worth of fabric every single year goes into landfill. So, and again, like, the key drivers of those um, that waste are decisions that are made by designers or during the design phase. So should designers play a role? Absolutely. That's just within our narrow purview, though. So that's just if we look at things like how are things designed, how are things made, um, and where are those decisions made. But equally, and this is part of the work that we're trying to do with the, the Australian Design Council, is that designers can play a role in thinking more broadly about where the organisation sits and where the product sits or where the service sits within a broader ecosystem. So start thinking more systemically about where our materials come from, how they're used, how they're treated, how they're put together, how things are manufactured, the choice of materials that are being used, not just in products but in services as well, and start thinking about well, what does our supply chain look like? What are our business models that we are enabling? What's the service delivery uh, infrastructure that we're putting in place so that we can repair things and reuse things and reclaim things? Those are all design decisions. And that's that's design as it's conceptualized today. None of that is new, but we don't pay enough attention to the outcomes of our design decisions. We, we're not as well connected or as closely connected to the outcomes. I don't know a single designer who's ever who's ever visited uh, um, like a landfill and seen their product dumped into a landfill somewhere um, and understand the impact that it's having on the environment. But that'd be a start. Have you been to a landfill? I have. Yes. What was what Awful. was that? What was the effect Awful. on you? Oh, it, it, I mean, I go to a landfill here, and it's it's only um, it's only full of trucks dumping tons and tons of rubbish. Landfill that you see overseas is full of people trying to find food and valuable things that they might be able to salvage to make a few dollars and and survive. Um, most of the waste that's produced in first world countries ends up in dumping sites in third world countries. And that's one of the other things that we need to stop. Um, this, this notion that we can export our waste and export our problems is something that we really need to tackle. And a few places, the European Union is one of them, um, but a few places are starting to put in place these measures that help to address at a systemic level those sorts of behaviours. All right. Um... I think a lot of us can follow along with uh, this plea and it's hard to argue against this. So this would beg the question, if we all agree that this is a good idea, mm. what's holding us back? Uh, and I know you're doing a lot of stuff around thinking in systems. Is that it? Like what, what's holding, why aren't we there yet? So it has taken us 50, 60, maybe 70 years for the systems that were designed post-World War II, and most of them are still in operation, um, to start to have the really noticeable and measurable impact that they're having today. Those systems have been working exactly as they were designed from the 50s 
they were ratcheted up in the 80s, 90s, 2000s with um, a, a widespread adoption around the developed economies of neoliberal capitalist ideas. So capitalism itself, problematic, but not really the problem. Neoliberalism and a lot of the sort of free market economics that come with it, um, the 50s and 60s with a real drive in consumerism and consumerist behaviours really started to ratchet up. But it was bit by bit by bit, Mark. It took 60, 70 years for those things to have a real impact. We're at the beginning of the next 50 years where we're going to roll back those issues. So it's going to take a while, just like it took a while in the 50s for us to start realising that actually things weren't great. Um, They really didn't present themselves until maybe the 60s or the 70s or the 80s kind of thing. We're in the early stages of that same transition. So we've got some of the pieces that are starting to be in place. We need to keep at them. We need to keep building them and allow them the time to compound over time, um, just like the problems have, the solutions are starting. The work's certainly not done. The work's just beginning. And I think that's important, but the work has begun and you look right around the world and you see evidence that that's happening. Makes sense. Um, I would be curious, like, if I'm on the operational level, I'm actually involved Mm -hmm. with designing Mm -hmm. products, with designing services, and I'm still operating in the paradigm from the last 50, 60 years. Um, Mm -hmm. That's going to create a lot of tension. So the decisions and the things that I value and that I want to make because yeah. I want to make a change isn't compatible with how the organization where I'm part of operates, how they earn their money. Yes. What would you say to someone like me? But that tension is, is very real, um, not to be trifled with, and certainly something that we need to address. So I don't wish to diminish the impact that being embedded in an organisation that is working in a particular way, that's producing certain things in certain ways, um, and your livelihood depends on it, um, the tension that that can create. One of the things, and we talk about this in uh, the book Designing Tomorrow, so there's a whole section on partnerships and working with other people and building coalitions of people who are you know, sort of actively willing to work, but you alone in an organization in an operational role. One of the things that we sort of advocate for is this idea of make yourself aware of the system within which you sit. Now, in the case of the person who's designing a product or a service, the most sort of adjacent um, system that you would be talking about is a sort of a life cycle analysis of your product or service. What goes in, what comes out, where does it end up? Those sorts of things. A very, very simple sort of system map. And start asking yourself questions. Are there things that I could change? Are there decisions that I could make differently within that system that would have a different positive impact? Just start there. Those sorts of things can likely be done with little or no tension within the organization. And a lot of the changes that you might suggest would actually be beneficial to the organization rather than detrimental to them. Can we go into a specific example? Is there any, like, is there a story that comes to your mind when you think about the changes that we could make? So if I think about things like, um, so textiles as an example. Sure. So, um, and, 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 um, a specific example is uh, so a furniture manufacturer um, based in Australia um, called King Living. They um, export and have operations in other parts of the world, but they came from Sydney, uh, Australia, um, so they're local. They're local to me. They they manufacture their frames out of steel, and that's a design decision that they've made. They've stuck with that despite the fact that other decisions would be more cost effective, but they've made that decision because by maintaining a steel frame, they maintain the integrity of the sofa, 
or the piece of furniture, the chair or whatever it might be, for decades Mm -hmm. rather than years. Now, as a result, they then don't design around that frame um, replaceable components. So rather than disposable components, they have repairable components, things that can be taken off and mended. So the fabric can all be taken off. It can all be mended. So rather than having to throw something away because it's become damaged, it can be repaired. So those sorts of small, those are all a series of design decisions, but those are design decisions that have been made intentionally with the idea that that piece of furniture will last for decades rather than years. Mm -hmm. So those, like that's that's an example of a series of design decisions that might be made differently um, to improve things. What does it require to make decisions like this? One of the things in so one of the things that I see and I look for is the opportunity to understand what it is that you've decided is outside your area of responsibility, but you're still producing. So the technical term is an externality, right? Um, and we talk about externalities um, quite a bit, but it's this idea that I, um, to, to give you an example, um, you know, I go to the supermarket and I buy a bottle of soft drink. Um, the manufacturer of that drink doesn't care what happens to that bottle, mm-hmm. right? So they, they make as many of them as they want. They sell them. And somebody else, because they've become so popular, we've got councils um, that have set up entire systems to collect that rubbish and do something useful with it. So the recycling industry is a response to the drink manufacturing industry and the bottling industry making a series of choices. And one of those choices was we don't care what happens with the empty bottle afterwards. So they created this externality. It's why we end up with so many um, bottles, like plastic bottles in particular, washing up into our beaches and out into our waterways. Um, Because they're easy to dispose and because they float and because the people who make them don't have to clean them up. If Coca-Cola had to clean up the bottles that they produced, the Mount Franklin bottles or the Dr. Pepper bottles or the whatever else that got out into the world, if they were responsible for the cleanup of them, they would make very, very different decisions. But this idea of within, within their area of operation that an organization can say, I don't have to worry about what happens after, that is a decision that I think we really need to shine some light on and change. That's interesting because we're getting, I don't know if we're getting away from design, but do you see that companies will willfully make these choices or is there something? They absolutely something... have. They absolutely have. They have but that, absolutely... Th- those are the exceptions. Uh, you mean like companies will actively choose to redraw their boundaries so that they take responsibility? No, I, I meant the opposite. So the companies who... That's the default uh, to redraw your boundaries, right? So the companies who who take ownership of uh, getting yep. their their waste back, they are the exception. And absolutely, yep. So we need government policies to incentivize or to punish. So one of the one of the areas uh, of of government regulation, Mark, that you'll start to see that coming in is in an area like right to repair legislation. Yes. So Europe Europe has introduced that recently. Australia is looking at it. I think America has introduced it recently for farm equipment. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like so, we're seeing some of it there. One might be listening to our conversation here and say, you know what, I'm throwing my hands up. Uh, this isn't something that I will be able to change bottom up. This needs to come from top level government policies. And then that's going to be the incentive that's going to create sort of the brief Mm -hmm. for designers to act differently because the incentives are different. Doesn't, 
<clears throat> I see a, a, a certain level of, I don't know, depression, paralysis um, um, in, in design. What do you see? It's an interesting reflection. And I will say that I, I maintain a sense of optimism that these things can change. And I, I think what we will see is a little bit of bottom up. Um, where individual designers and design um, organizations are pushing for better design decisions to be made and taking responsibility for those design decisions and really advocating for them. Um, you see it in award programs, what wins, um, you know, design, uh, design award programs, what gets called out, what gets acknowledged and recognized, that kind of thing. That's all starting to shift. And the idea of... Um, you know, sort of holding up and, and rewarding someone who's producing something that is clearly not environmentally sound, that is clearly going to produce pollution, that's toxic and, and all of those things we're starting to move away from. The other thing that I, I will say is that government regulation is not a bad thing. Government regulation is, is a really, really good thing in my mind, especially when we're trying to get for-profit businesses to do the right thing um, for the environment and for people. They are not altruistic organisations. It's not in their nature to do things just because they're nice if it will cost them money. It's mm -hmm. just the way they're set up to operate. So government needs to regulate um, and start to drive that change. And, and as I say, like we've seen some interesting shifts in government legislation where they are moving towards putting in place these programs that actively advocate for different design choices to be made. Um, I had just one really quick example. I had a few minutes with the Australian um, Federal uh, Environment Minister a couple of weeks ago, um, and the first word she said to me was, design is critical for us to achieve what we want to achieve as a country. That's encouraging, and um, yeah. I'm happy that, that you're hopeful and optimistic. Uh, these are like the time span of these changes and you already alluded upon that um yes this is going to take um years if not decades it will how do we how do you remain optimistic and how do you keep uh, a long term perspective because if it's going to take so long to see the benefits of your work and if you're pushing against the stream, right, mm. that's that's tiring. It it takes a lot of energy. Um, Interestingly, though, Mark, I mean that that notion of doing things today for the next generation or the generation after it, or someone who may benefit from it in you know a few hundred years' time, is is fundamentally a part of most uh, indigenous cultures. So the idea that we do things today um, that we may not see the benefit of, planting of seeds, um, you know, like cutting down something, uh, you know, a particular way of hunting or carving stone or leaving behind something, whatever it might be, that idea that the decisions that I'm making will have longer term repercussions. And so I'm very, I need to be much more considerate about the decisions that I'm making. So that's one part of it. But the second part of it is that the decision that I'm making is not necessarily for my benefit, that the things that I'm doing are simply the right things to be doing. Mm. And they may pay off in a hundred years or a thousand years. But they will, they will pay off. They're the right direction for us to be heading, and it's one of the things I think. Um, and it it happens to be uh, Reconciliation Week in Australia. It's a week of activities where we attempt to bridge this gap, especially in Australia, which is a colonial uh, country. Um, this gap between our traditional owners and the the traditional custodians of uh, the Australian landscape, the the Aboriginal Australians. Um, with Western culture and the colonialist uh, institutions. So we've got a whole week of the year where we try and reconcile ourselves to what we've done. Um, but it's interesting that that is that shift in thinking, that shift from these sort of short-term, very economic um, decisions to much more longer-term, 
much more social and environmental decisions first um, is something that we, we, we just have to wrap our heads around. Let's, let's explore this a bit more because mm. designing for the next generation or the next 10 generations and making sure that we leave the planet in a better state than mm. we inherited it. The, the metrics for success and knowing that you're moving in the right directions, mm. I'm curious on your, what are they? Because if we take our short-term financial incentives, they yeah. are pretty clear. Like we're making yeah. more or less money, right? We're extracting yeah. more or less wealth. Our stakeholders are happy. Our stock is going up or down. Like, yeah, that's very obvious. If I'm designing for the next hundred years, yeah, how, like where do I even start to know if the actions that I'm taking today, right now, in this minute, mm -hmm. are the actions that are going to contribute to that success? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. Um, there are some really simple ones. So one of the easiest ones to really look at is um, the provenance of the materials that are used in the thing that you're making. Where did they come from? Just, just look at that metric. What percentage of those materials are recycled and what, what percentage of those materials were produced um, from raw materials or from scratch? Right, so how much of it's being reused versus how much of it is is being introduced new? Shift that percentage over time. Change that percentage over time. Shift towards the use of recycled, reclaimed, or reused materials as an overall percentage of the the total material that you are creating or that you are using. Do the same for the energy that that goes into your production process. So instead of using coal, oil, or gas to produce the energy that goes into your manufacturing and service delivery processes, use renewable energy sources, wind, solar, um, hydro are the three main ones, geothermal as well is another uh, good one. But if you just track those two metrics, so the percentage of reused materials, recycled, reclaimed, et cetera, and the... Um, the source of the energy that you use and you shift those over time, that's a really good indicator of whether you're doing something good or bad. I love those. And uh, I hope people would, uh, in the comments, come up with more of these metrics. These mm. are very um, tied to physical products, which are obviously sure. a, big, a big challenge and a big part of the problem. As service design professionals, we are maybe yep. less uh, connected to physical products. We are more in invested so, in, so, yeah. So yes and no. Yes Tell and us. no. Tell us. So services are still delivered in locations. They they still offer s uh, many of the same things. So a service will be in a restaurant or a branch or a service center, in a retail outlet, a supermarket, whatever it might be. Um, each of those environments has furniture, flooring, lighting, um, all of which is governed by the same metric of waste and, and recycled materials. Um, one of the biggest areas I should mention of um, waste, especially in the built environment and in the construction industry, comes from office fit-outs uh, and retail fit-outs when they change them over. Almost all of it goes straight to landfill. Like hardly any of it is reused, and it's not designed to be reused either. But similarly, when it comes to uh, an electronic service or the digital element of a service, so if we think about something that's completely intangible, something that's delivered via digital channels only, um, the energy that gets used to serve up a web page, to respond to a search, to respond to a query, AI queries are particularly bad. They use a lot more energy than a regular search query does. Um, but if we optimize our web pages, if we reduce the amount of JavaScript that needs to be downloaded, reduce the amount of CSS that needs to be loaded, we're actively contributing to reducing the energy use of that service. Now, all of that is within the area of service design. There are There, there is actually a website that calculates the carbon footprint of every website, I think. And 
right? Yeah. There, um, I know uh, of a true story of a big uh, furniture manufacturer uh, from Sweden who tested like what their for <laughs> carbon footprint is of their mm -hmm. website, and for them, were they like, horrified? Um, well, um, I don't know if they were horrified, but the uh, there were some very easy wins. Like if they make a one yes. percent one percent change. That that has massive, massive impact, right? Yeah. Look, let, let me let me just put it in really concrete terms. In term, like uh, just to highlight the impact that these things can have and these decisions can can have. Most of the um, energy generation in the United States that has been added, so capacity that has been added over the last five to ten years. Um, that renewable energy capacity in wind and solar in particular in the United States. Most of that additional capacity from renewables has not been used to retire coal, oil, gas, or nuclear energy. It's been bought up by Microsoft and Google uh, and the larger tech companies to drive their data centers and their AI-based queries. I want to I wanna circle back on... Um a few topics that have been addressed on the show in the recent months, um, especially around the idea of sustainability and designing for the planet. <laughs> um, I had a conversation with Anna van der Tocht from Live Work, uh, where we mm -hmm. explored, for instance, the role of an insurance company yeah. uh, that it could have, for instance, how to reconnect people with the with nature. Um, okay. I, we had a conversation with Alan Moore about beauty as a metric mm. for mm -hmm. designers. Yeah. So, <clears throat> of course, we can think about our carbon footprint and energy and the materials we use. Yeah. Have you also explored and considered things like the role design-ish designers play in reconnecting consumers with nature with each other i can imagine mm -hmm. that that's also a quality like we want to be more connected to each other instead of we do. creating more division within the world there are a lot of opportunities there like there are a lot of opportunities there for design and designers to contribute to um how we see ourselves in in relation to nature and the closeness of our connection to to nature um so one of the uh, one of the overriding themes of you know the last five hundred years of Western civilization has been a disconnection from nature. We've gone out of our way to prove ourselves um, disconnected from nature, separate from nature. We we talk about the way in which we control the natural environment, and we talk about it as something that is other than us, right? Um, and the truth is that. We are absolutely part of nature. Um, and if you want to run an experiment, go into space and step outside and see how long you last. Um, we just don't survive very well in the absence of uh, a, a planet to take care of us. Um, but when we design, if we think about the way in which we design services in particular, products to an extent, but, but the combination of those things, a lot of it comes with a narrative around um, provenance, around use, around significance and meaning, um, all of which can be connected back to the natural environment and help us be more connected to the natural environment. There are all sorts of ways that we might do it. Um, you see it in restaurants when they talk about sort of farm to plate type um, restaurant services, the design of a menu that uses more of the um, more of the food so that there's less waste. They talk about where it was grown and how it was grown and this kind of thing. That's one example. The use of organic fibers in clothing, um, the story around those fibers and where they were grown, um, the use of things like uh, woolen fibres in clothing and that kind of stuff with a, a direct connection back to the farm on which they were grown. Um, I think it was Xenia um, uh, probably six or eight years ago bought a really high-grade um, merino farm in Australia um, and they started making a direct connection as part of their story as a fashion label was tied to the sheep 
and the farm and where it was grown and how they, you know, like that whole sort of um, thread, pardon that pun, but um, they sort of created this narrative structure that started with sheep on a farm and ended on a catwalk or a, a clothing store in Milan or in, you know, New York or Paris or somewhere else. But we certainly see that and and all of that is is design. Um, the crafting of that narrative, and I think narrative in particular is a key strength of service design and service designers. We think in those sorts of structures much more than product designers do, I think. Um, but it's absolutely fundamental to what we do. And I love these examples because I think they are um, very closely, maybe more relatable to the work of service design professionals who think about connection, relationships, processes, um, Mm. and less about the tangible stuff, uh, which doesn't yeah. disregard. We should think about the tangible stuff, the, the footprint that we have. Um, mm. I'm curious if there's something, like is there, um, is there something that would uh, accelerate the shift, um, like, if you could change something overnight uh, that would make a drastic change and help us to to get here in 10 years instead of 50, like what would that be? The thing that I would want to see changed is, and, and I think the only thing that would get us there uh, in that kind of time frame is global government regulation. Like with targets and rules and penalties that were enforced and all of those sorts of um, things, I think that's the key thing that would accelerate this process. Um, and there's there's a number of different ways or a number of different things that I would directly target. So if I was going to say, well, what are those things that you would regulate and and enforce? So one would be the accelerated shift away from fossil fuels. And if we accelerate the shift away from fossil fuels in our energy, um, we can also sh accelerate the shift away from fossil fuels in the production of plastics. So one of the real growth areas in fossil fuels, if you're in, in, interested in, in it as an industry over the last little while, has been in plastics production. So fossil fuels are one of the key ingredients to the production of plastic. Um, if we retire fossil fuels from energy and we retire plastics from the world, we are a long way down the path of starting to roll back some of these other changes. So as an industry, if we can move away from it, like literally decarbonize our industry, decarbonize our economies, we're going a long way towards resolving that issue. Now, Plastics need to be replaced by something else. We don't have the forests and the forestry infrastructure to produce the wood that might replace it, um, which is why you need to start thinking in more circular terms um, and increasing the longevity with which individual materials circulate through the system, right? So instead of it being used once, it's used, recycled, reused, recycled, reused, recycled, um, over and over and over again so you don't have that same pressure on the planet anyone who chooses to work that way should incur a penalty so anyone who is responsible for that um, material intensity on the land then gets hit economically mm. just do those things and and then if those that companies gets us in 10 years right? <laughs> Well, yeah, uh, if the companies uh, get uh, penalized for certain uh, types of behaviors, they're going to uh, shift the penalty to the consumers. And that's eventually the thing that's going to drive the change, right? It's where you and I spend our money. Yeah, but if we choose not to spend it on a good that's now more expensive... Mm -hmm. And instead, we choose to buy a good that has been made in a way that doesn't get penalized. Yeah. Then 
the company that is continuing to put that pressure on the environment quickly goes out of business. Exactly. And that's the beauty of those incentives, right? So exactly. you design this system to encourage the behavior that you want. You design it to punish the behaviors that you don't, both at the production side and on the demand side. And before you know it, you've got a long, a lot of progress towards the goal. This is why, um, so France recently introduced a, a levy on all um, fast fashion, like all um, all garments that are sold in France now attract a levy. That levy is only used on um, textiles that are made from scratch. Hmm. So any secondhand clothing doesn't attract the levy. And any clothing made with recycled material doesn't attract the levy. Australia just introduced the same thing. It comes into force on the 1st of July. We are listening to the story and um, we are getting excited about the potential. We see the need, we see the urgency. At the same time, we live in a reality where the organizations that we're at aren't there yet or are, yeah. are even working against this and keeping the status yes. quo in place as long as possible yep. because that's in their current um, benefit. Mm -hmm. Is the thing, the best thing we can do either to quit and find a better environment and put our efforts there? Or should we try to uh, change the system from within? Should we join communities and find allies? Like, what to do? The, the first thing I would just sort of say is that not everyone is able to quit their job. Um, so not everyone has the financial stability or the financial backing or the foundations and the savings and all the rest of it to just say, I can't work with this company anymore. So it, it's important to recognize that. Um, it's a valid choice to continue to support your family financially, right? If you are in a position to leave and go and work for an organization that is better aligned with the sorts of uh, ways of being that we're talking about, do it. Uh, I'd encourage you to do it. Um, it rewards them. Um, it provides them with better talent so that they can be more competitive in the market their products and services will increase in, in value, they'll be able to do more. Um, if you can't leave where you are, then absolutely look at those opportunities to improve it from within. And as I say, there are a lot of little ways that you might start to do that um, that may not actually be financially detrimental to the company that you're working for. Asking questions about well, what happens downstream? Could we make different choices in terms of our inputs, etc.? Those are reasonable things that you might do that can have an impact um, straight away. On the other side, though, we're all consumers as well. We all get to choose in a lot of cases who we buy our clothing from, who we buy our furniture from, which car manufacturer we choose to drive, etc. Is it a uh, petrol-driven car or is it a, a, an, an electric vehicle? Like all of those are choices as well. The, the question that I still have is, mm -hmm. there are, the, what does good look like? Uh, what does good mm -hmm. design look like? And nowadays, it feels that there are so many variables and so many parameters that mm -hmm. it's impossible to adhere to all those standards. And I don't know, uh, standards regarding the environment, standards regarding uh, equality, standards regarding, mm. there are a lot of standards. Um, I feel it's so, it, it gets overwhelming. Is a strategy to say, it's just part of the job and uh, we have to deal with it? Or would you, would you encourage us, well, you know, Pick an area, women's rights or sustainability, sure. and sure. Uh, and be the champion around setting, showing and showing what good design looks like in that area. So I wouldn't necessarily say um, that any element of that is worthy of. So we talk about the different elements of good design. Okay. Um, there are lots of different ways of thinking about it and lots of different ways of sort of teasing that apart. And that's that's fair enough. I don't really think you can set aside any of those and say, you don't have to worry about that one. Um, I think as we, as we grow and mature the practice of design, we continue needing to look at 
um, adding things to our tool set and the way in which we, we do things. So issues like quality or um, gender equity or um, the environmental uh, impact of our products, et cetera, these are all things that we absolutely um, can do something on. Is it, is it the case, though, that in your organisation, one of those elements might be more critical than another or more available to you than another, quite possibly. And the thing that I encourage people to do is to try and identify the path that's available to them where they can have the most impact. And that will be different for everybody. And it will be different in different countries, countries that support particular ways of working or particular um, you know, initiatives around sustainability or equity or whatever it might be. You might find that that environment allows your effort to have an outsized impact than it would say if you were in America instead or if you were in Australia instead or if you were in China instead or whatever it might be. Understanding where your effort can have the most impact and the area that it can have the most impact is always going to be useful. As you said, we are maturing, we are getting more sophisticated, mm -hmm. we are getting more nuanced. Um, um, it's hard. Like you, you won't get away with saying that you've made an environmentally regenerative product or service while the laborers are being exploited exactly right. <laughs> that's exactly right, right? that's like that's that's, that's not fair that's not going to fly so yeah yeah you um, don't get a medal for that one no probably not um uh, rightfully so um and i think we just need more stories and examples of people sharing what good looks like good and, what it, and what it can yeah. look like because it like we how do how do we define these standards how do we set these standards what do we know what it, like some things are obvious exploitation of people, but uh, the, the gray area is pretty big. We can start the journey, even if we're not sure of what the destination might look like. We, can, we, we will often be able to identify what in, an improvement looks like, what does better look like. Um, so it may, not be, it may not be great. It may not be the best version of that thing, but we know that we can improve. And there are some metrics that we can simply look at and go, okay, I can see that I'm improving on that metric. And there are all sorts of ones that we might do. But I think the important thing is for us not to be defeatist and not for us to be sort of nihilistic about it and instead go, I'm going to start that journey and I'm going to do the little bits that I can and I will trust that others will do the little bits that they can. And if we share our stories and encourage each other to do it, then over time we will have the kind of impact that we really want to be seeing. We've got to start. Hmm. That's really the critical part. We've got to start. You've already shared uh, quite a few practical tips on how to uh, eat this elephant one spoon at a time. Mm. You've done a lot of thinking about around this topic. You've written a book. I'm sure that in your journey, you've also encountered some new questions. And to sort of wrap, wrap our conversation up, mm. what is the question, the most burning question right now on your mind that you'd like to maybe also for us to think about? The, th the thing that bothers me most, Mark, is our ability to overcome the outsized influence that wealth has on politics. And the reason why that's important is just to circle back on a point we were discussing earlier around the importance of regulation. Now, those regulations hurt billionaires and those billionaires fund political campaigns and the politicians who get elected owe them favours. And it's why we don't see enough regulation. It's why during the Trump camp, uh, the, uh, the Trump presidency from 2016 to 2020, he went out of his way to roll back regulation and roll back consumer protection, roll back environmental protection to make it easier for large corporations in America to rip off consumers and damage the environment. They don't like it. And they're the ones funding the political campaigns. So that's the bit that I'm... Um, you know, if, if anything keeps me up at night, it's that part, because during the two years, the first two years of the pandemic, the billionaire class around the world increased its wealth by $2.3 trillion. 
And at the same time, the bottom 50% of the population, the global population, three and a half billion people, their combined wealth decreased by about the same amount. That's an awful lot of concentrated power in a very, very short period of time. That's the bit that I worry most about, mm. is that accelerating cycle of political influence that comes from wealth. And we discussed thinking in systems, and this is an yes. interesting system to not only think about, but redesign and probably radically redesign. Yeah. We at least need to protect those democratic institutions wherever we find them. We, we, we at least need to do that part of it. But money in politics um, and that little, that little cycle is, is something that worries me. Um, we're not going to solve that on this uh, episode today, but it is definitely something no. to, worth, uh, it's a worthwhile topic to <laughs> keep thinking about. Um, yeah. Steve, I want to thank you for um, putting this topic on the agenda, uh, addressing this, uh, bringing it forward. I hope uh, that you'll keep on doing what you're doing because we need people like you who sort of get on the soapbox and uh, keep sharing and advocating for uh, this cause. Thanks, Mark. It's been a pleasure. Steve's optimism is contagious. It's clear that change is not only possible, but that we are already seeing inspiring examples of companies and individuals making a real difference. The key is to move beyond the traditional and maybe somewhat narrow definition of good design. It's time to redefine our playing field and set the bar higher for ourselves and the design industry as a whole. Let's continue to keep challenging ourselves to think bigger, act bolder, and design a better future for all. This conversation has definitely ignited a spark in me and I hope it has in you as well. If you enjoyed today's conversation, you can do me one big favor. Click the like button on this video if you haven't done so already. Not to feed the YouTube algorithm, but rather to let me know whether or not we are on the right track by addressing topics like this. Finally, before we part ways, please take a moment to reflect and celebrate that by joining us today, you have directed your attention towards learning and growing as a professional. So from everyone who you are going to impact through your work, thank you for taking the time and making the commitment. My name is Mark Fontijn, and I look forward to seeing you again in the next conversation on the Service Design Show. Take care and see you soon.